Day after day, we are surrounded by the presence of criminals. We are spectators to the deepest darkness in human actions and the bizarre reality that someone's suffering can be a form of pleasure. As dedicated investigators of the criminal world, we're on a mission to uncover the most shocking crimes and get inside the minds of those who commit them. I am Luke, and today I bring you another unreal true crime. The Case of Maria Cash Maria Cash, the sole daughter in a family of four siblings, was a resident of the Barracas neighborhood in Buenos Aires. She was born on December 5, 1981, and enjoyed a blissful childhood with her parents, Federico and Maria del Carmen, along with her brothers Maximo, Patricio, and Santiago. From a tender age, she grasped the significance of friendship when she crossed paths with a girl named Carolina at the age of six forging a bond that would endure a lifetime. Subsequently, during their third year of high school, Maria and her best friend Carolina welcomed another addition to their circle, Mariana, who seamlessly became an inseparable part of their group. Maria's social circle was characterized by its quality rather than quantity. Although she maintained amicable relations with her family, she bore the reputation of a rather solitary individual. Even when surrounded by people, she possessed the unique ability to disconnect and revel in solitude. As she matured and gained more independence, whenever she yearned for solitude, she would simply decide to retreat in a coastal city in Argentina known for its pristine beaches, distinctive architectural beauty, and abundant pine forests. Upon arriving, she routinely switched off her cell phone, leaving her friends and family without news of her for several days. Maria developed her talents as a designer and took charge of selling the clothing she crafted. Additionally, she was involved in the sales and promotion of various products. In contrast to her preference for solitude and moments of introspection, Maria displayed a warm and courteous demeanor towards others. Acquaintances frequently remarked on her perpetual smile and serene countenance, making her a delightful presence to be around. Her lively and energetic nature added to her charm. Carolina and Mariana portrayed her as a free spirit with a deep affinity for nature. They emphasized that she lived a modest existence, but consistently extended invitations to dine with her friends and never forgot to mark their birthdays, even if it meant gifting them with a handmade flower. Nevertheless, Carolina also noted Maria's enigmatic side. At some point during her youth, Maria joined a spiritual group, a religious movement centered on self-realization. This pursuit resonated deeply with her, as it provided a platform for meditation exercises aimed at achieving inner peace. While seemingly incongruous to outsiders, this spiritual practice held profound meaning for her, accentuating her inherently spiritual and tranquil disposition. Maria's involvement in the group, along with the enigmatic inner circle she cultivated within the group, remained shrouded in secrecy from her friends and family. Despite its fundamental role in her life, she limited her disclosures to the fact that she dedicated extensive hours to meditation in pursuit of self-awareness. It was within the realms of this group that Maria crossed paths with Juan Pablo, a teacher, proprietor of a restaurant, and government employee in Hugui. He resided at the picturesque town located 13 kilometers to the north of San Salvador de Hui. Over time, Juan Pablo and Maria's friendship deepened to a point where their closeness sparked speculations among both acquaintances and family members. Mariana and Carolina recalled Maria's glowing remarks about him. In late June 2011, Maria confided in her friends, expressing her desire to journey to Hui to promote her products, a decision that raised eyebrows considering the considerable distance and geographical separation from the capital. Maria meticulously orchestrated her trip to Hui, veiling the true purpose from everyone, or at least weaving three different narratives. 
She casually mentioned her intention to rest, to sell some of her handmade garments, and even claimed that a friend had extended a job offer at a bar in Hui. During a phone call in the presence of her friends, she cryptically mentioned a job opportunity from a Hui-based friend without divulging further details. She outlined her plans to depart in July and return to Buenos Aires by December. In the days preceding her journey, Maria convened with her friends for a dinner gathering at Mariana's residence. That night, she shared an overwhelming desire to spread the love of God among people. She carried a Bible brimming with highlighted passages, marking a newfound religiosity, as per Mariana's recollection. In reference to her voyage to Hui, Federico Cash, her father, explained that she sought serenity and opted for a destination devoid of the chaos of the capital. She had informed him about a job offer at a friend's bar. On July 4, Maria commenced her journey and at 7.30 p.m., left her home, packing minimally, indicating her intention to be away for just a few days. Her father, Federico, accompanied her to the bus terminal, where she was set to board a bus destined for San Salvador de Hui, scheduled to arrive around 6 p.m. the following day. Little did he know that it would be the last time he saw her alive. Somewhere along the journey, an event occurred that remained shrouded in ambiguity to this day, lacking clarity in its entirety. What is unequivocal is that on July 5, Maria made an unexpected decision to disembark in Rosario de la Frontera, a town situated in the province of Salta. This deviation from the plan caught everyone by surprise. In subsequent communications with her family and her friend Juan Pablo, she vaguely alluded to her discomfort with certain fellow passengers, citing an unpleasant experience during the bus ride. However, she refrained from disclosing the true nature of the situation. Standing by the roadside, Maria resorted to hitchhiking and ventured southward until she reached Santiago del Estero. None of these detours aligned with her original itinerary. Nevertheless, after reconnecting with her friend Juan Pablo and disclosing her financial predicament, she resolved to resume her journey. He generously offered to purchase her a bus ticket online, enabling her to continue her voyage to Hugui. Maria eventually arrived in Hugui in the early hours of Wednesday, July 6. During her stay there, she contacted Juan Pablo from a local mechanics workshop where she had borrowed a phone. Juan Pablo's sister answered the call, informing her that he was occupied with work and couldn't personally pick her up. Instead, she suggested taking a taxi, with the assurance that they would cover the fare upon her arrival. Subsequently, all communication with Maria ceased. When Juan Pablo returned home, he found her absent. At approximately 4.30 am, he sent her numerous messages, urging her to either visit her grandmother's house or one of his own restaurants. He provided detailed addresses and insisted on covering the taxi fare, but received neither a response nor her arrival. Around 2 p.m., the young woman was spotted once more, attempting to hitchhike along Route 34. During that afternoon, she conversed with her family, revealing that she had depleted her funds and was feeling unwell, yet she refrained from divulging further details. On the night of July 6, she was captured on video passing through a toll booth. Notably, she was without her suitcase but carried a backpack. Remarkably, the same backpack seen in the footage was discovered by toll booth employees who chose to retain it and eventually handed it over to the police several days later. According to some accounts of the case on July 7, Maria sought medical attention at a hospital in Salta. However, as the medical examination was about to commence, she opted to depart. Witnesses attested to her appearing disoriented and erratic, as if she lacked a clear sense of direction or purpose. Her overall appearance was somewhat disheveled. Nevertheless, she did manage to consult a pulmonologist in downtown San Salvador de Hui. He charged her 100 pesos for the consultation and prescribed medication for a respiratory issue. In contrast to the descriptions provided by those who encountered her at the hospital, the pulmonologist asserted that she exhibited perfect lucidity, cleanliness, and neatness. These conflicting reports presented a perplexing challenge for investigators. On the same day, 
July 7, she embarked on a journey to Salta. A truck driver who had previously seen her in Pampa Blanca, Hui, confirmed encountering her while walking along a street in downtown Salta. Another woman also observed her in the vicinity, seemingly in search of a craft store that included a gym on its upper floor. Around 5 p.m., from an internet cafe in that city, Maria sent an email to her brothers, requesting their phone numbers. In the email, she expressed her desire to return to Buenos Aires, citing the loss of her belongings. Regrettably, the communication abruptly terminated, instilling concern within her family. Consequently, they promptly made the decision to report her disappearance, filing a formal complaint at a police station in Salta. Fearing the worst, her father and one of her brothers opted to embark on a car journey to Hubui. Nonetheless, their efforts to locate her proved futile, as she had already moved on from the area. It appears that on July 8th, Maria engaged in an unexpected encounter at the toll booth. She boarded a van driven by a producer and former councilman from the Salta locality. He transported her to the roundabout, where Maria once again solicited a new ride. This time, she succeeded in securing a ride from a truck driver heading to Route 34. Witnesses who encountered her in that vicinity attested to her appearing bewildered and disoriented. She disembarked at a religious pilgrimage site and was spotted in the vicinity of the sanctuary at approximately four o'clock in the afternoon. Following this moment, all trace of her vanished. Right from the outset, Maria's family pointed out numerous shortcomings in the investigation. For an initial period of eight months, the case was categorized as a mere disappearance, with the Salta judicial system overseeing the inquiry. However, in early 2012, Maria's father, lodged a report suggesting the possibility of human trafficking. Consequently, the case and its investigation were transferred to the Federal Prosecutor's Office in Salta. The investigation proved to be an intricate puzzle due to the abundance of false leads, some motivated by ill intent and others stemming from genuine concern. Furthermore, Maria's physical description was rather commonplace. A young woman of slender build, average height, with dark hair and eyes. These particulars aligned with the characteristics of countless individuals, resulting in a deluge of incoming calls that ultimately led the investigation astray, as these leads failed to yield any substantive progress. One of the most perplexing aspects that impeded the search was the uncertainty surrounding Maria's intended destination. She underwent three transfers across different provinces, introducing an additional layer of complexity. A multitude of lineups, extensive interrogations, consultations, and inspections were conducted, all to no avail. Additionally, two extensive search operations were carried out in the region and along Route 34 in an endeavor to eliminate the possibility that she had ventured into the wilderness to spend the night or, alternatively, had fallen victim to a crime along the highway. Speculation even arose that she might have boarded another bus and journey to a different region of the country. As the months elapsed, the hypothesis of human trafficking began to wane. Maria's age did not conform to the typical profile sought by human traffickers, who typically target adolescents or significantly younger women. Nevertheless, it was never entirely dismissed, with investigators pivoting their focus toward the potential occurrence of a psychotic episode. Remarkably, in the testimony provided, Maria was portrayed as being poorly dressed, disheveled, and seemingly adrift. She embarked on and disembarked from buses, engaged in hitchhiking, and had even misplaced her identification documents. Contradictorily, Juan Pablo, one of the last individuals to converse with her, recounted that during their telephone exchanges, she exhibited a sense of normalcy, offering no indication of being disconnected from reality or under the influence of substances. There was no discernible sense of fear or urgency in her voice, nor did it seem like she was evading anyone. He emphasized that their conversation flowed like any ordinary exchange between friends. However, he did acknowledge two aspects that struck him, her admission of having no money and her decision to head to Hugui without confirming his presence there. He described Maria as an exceptional person, 
noting that he had never known her to grapple with substance dependencies. He expressed astonishment at her sudden visit to Hugui because they had lost touch for a considerable period, and out of the blue, she called to inform him of her presence there. Simultaneously with the official investigation, Maria's family pursued their search independently. They frequently voiced their frustration with the sluggish pace of the police investigation and the lack of tangible progress. After her disappearance, they engaged in conversations with numerous truck drivers, shopkeepers, neighbors, and law enforcement officers. Across these cities, they disseminated flyers bearing her photograph and contact information for individuals who might possess pertinent information. It was reported that they gathered more than 4,000 leads, yet the overwhelming majority proved to be either false or malicious. Maria's friend, Juan Pablo, also conducted his own inquiries. They come through police stations, private clinics, public hospitals, and forensic facilities. The police conducted extensive searches and explored numerous theories, yet with time, most of these leads were discounted. Maria's friends even contemplated the possibility that she might have experienced a psychological episode during which she lost self-recognition, track of time, or fell victim to drugging followed by abduction. Nonetheless, these notions remained firmly within the realm of conjecture due to the absence of concrete evidence. Within this context, it is noteworthy that the relentless search conducted by the Cash family did not go unrewarded. While it did not yield Maria's whereabouts, it did lead to the discovery of other women who had fallen prey to criminal organizations engaged in human trafficking. These women had been ensnared in various locations and were ultimately rescued, thanks to the Cash family's endeavors in sharing their stories with the authorities. Amidst this unyielding pursuit, tragedy befell the family once more. In 2014, during one of their numerous journeys across the country in pursuit of any trace or lead, Maria's father tragically lost his life in a traffic accident in La Pampa. He had ventured there to distribute flyers bearing his daughter's visage. Several weeks following his passing, his wife received a phone call that rekindled her determination, faith, and optimism to continue the fight. Pope Francis extended his condolences for her husband's demise, expressing his heartfelt sorrow. In response, she wrote a letter of gratitude, wherein she conveyed how the Holy Father's compassionate words had filled her heart with love and rekindled the faith and hope that had dwindled from her life nearly three years earlier, alongside the disappearance of her daughter. Following Maria's father's tragic passing, his children persisted in their quest to locate Maria. Yet, as is often the case in disappearance investigations, they appeared trapped in a labyrinth, devoid of new leads to guide them. Then, in 2018, a significant development emerged when human remains, including a skull, were discovered in the Bolivian city of Oruro. There was hope that these remains might provide answers about the fate of the young designer, and this possibility garnered extensive media coverage. However, subsequent DNA analysis conclusively ruled out any connection to Maria. The Salta judiciary confirmed that the DNA extracted from the recovered remains did not match that of the Cash family, whose samples had been collected in Salta. Consequently, the mystery surrounding Maria's disappearance persisted, much like it did at the outset of the investigation. In that same year, 2018, a woman named Julia came forward, alleging physical abuse and cruel treatment, and implicating her ex-husband, a prison guard, in Maria's disappearance. She claimed to have witnessed Maria alive and held captive within a human trafficking network, at least until 2013, two years after her initial disappearance. Julia's attorney stated that, according to his client's testimony, these women were confined in a piece of land with rented infrastructure. While this lead was diligently pursued, it too failed to yield the discovery of Maria. The subsequent year, in September 2019, as part of this renewed investigative approach, search operations were conducted in an area known as Las Palomitas in Salta, based on information provided by an anonymous witness. Regrettably, these searches produced no results that could advance the investigation. In November 2020, 
forensic experts released an updated image of Maria Cash, employing age progression techniques. The intention behind this effort was to assist in her potential identification and to prompt new leads. Maria's family expressed hope that this initiative would yield fruitful results. However, once more, these endeavors proved unfruitful. In a succinct recapitulation of the case's progression in 2023, certain Argentine media outlets revisited the topic of Maria's disappearance. They underscored that during the early years of the search, numerous leads were pursued and a plethora of hypotheses were formulated. However, as time passed, these trails gradually dissipated and the prospects of locating her dwindled. Nonetheless, the authorities remained steadfast in asserting that the search had never been abandoned. And that's the end of today's case. As always, I appreciate your support for my work. If you subscribe, like, and share this video, it will help me continue creating content. This was another episode of Crime Analysis Central. See you soon.